family. It's good to see you virtually, as it were. Uh, old, di- old habits die hard, but it's good to be with you nonetheless. Uh, I hope that you're doing well and that you've been greeted by someone in the chat. Uh, if you're watching this after the fact, well, I hope that you're, <laughs> you're with someone you love and, and uh, this whole thing is it's, it's a challenge because we're, we're not sure where we are, but it's good to be able to spend some time in the Word together, and my hope is that it would be an encouragement to you. Before, though, we get into the Word, I just wanted to give some updates. First of all, thank you so much for how you have been supporting uh, all that we're doing for our food drive. We've been working very hard to collect food on Tuesdays and Fridays between 12 and 3 here at the Ridgetop office. Uh, And this has been an amazing moment. Uh, It's been encouraging to me just to see you come out and the community come out to support this community. Loudoun County has a lot of needs, and we've been able to really dig in and and support them. We've been working with this organization called Mobile Hope, and uh, they have actually a bus and a van, and they they deliver to various locations, and we've helped them uh, on Wednesdays with their their drop-off or their, their delivery uh, in our Sterling locations. So thank you if you've been involved with that. If you haven't and you want to get involved, you can email us. You can, you can talk to some, one of our hosts in the, in the chat, but um, make sure you, you find a way to get involved because it's really amazing. Uh, I wanted to encourage you, uh, if, you uh, are not, if you are not connected right now, to get connected in a small group. Uh, there's never been an easier time for you to be in a small group. You don't even have to leave your house. Now, I understand some of the parents are looking at me and saying it, it, is, it is more difficult. And, you know, there are ways to navigate those challenges, uh, and I leave it to you to figure that out. Uh, we can have a conversation offline, but, but please get connected in a small group. These are, this is the moment for you to stay in community. One of the things that makes the church the church is the fact that we are a community of faith. In the same way that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are a community of love, we reflect that in being a community of faith. And so I would just encourage you, get connected in a small group. You can find out more information about our small groups at uh, our website, or you can, you can email us at sterling at gracecove.org, uh, and, and we, we'll get you connected. So I wanted to consider this question as we, as we study the Word today. I know that, that we've heard probably, if you've, you've been paying attention, especially in, in Christian circles, this, this reflection on Romans 8.28, God works all things for the, for the good of those who uh, love Him and are called according to His purpose. And, and there's this idea, and it's a good idea, this, an appropriate idea floating around that, that God is working all things for your good. He's working the good things for your good, and, and we understand that, we appreciate it when things go well, you know, when that, that stimulus check comes in and it, and it helps us pay the bills, uh, when, when things are going smoothly at work. But God also works the, the tough things for our good. And, and our faith really is tested and challenged when we experience hardship and, and really a, a sense of our own weakness and inability to, to manage our lives. And it's in those moments that this question of, okay, what does it look like for Him to work all things for our good? How should you and I relate to our difficulties, our afflictions, and our hardships? And I wanted to look and see what Paul has to say to us about the relationship between our weakness and and God's strength. So if you will read along with me, I'm going to be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. Paul says this, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that he should, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient to you, for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness." Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's pray. Father God, this is is a challenging teaching for us in that we are have such a strong desire to be strong. 
Lord, I, I recognize in my own soul there's a desire for me to be able to manage my own life by my own ability, and yet I'm constantly faced with the reality that I am not able to do it. God, I thank you that there is grace available to us when we stop trying to, to be God in our own situations and begin to trust you as our God. And so God, I pray that you would help us to embrace the weaknesses that you've placed into our lives in order that we might be able to receive and experience your power, your strength, your deliverance. I pray this all in the name of your awesome and mighty son, Jesus. Amen. So Paul, we, we jumped in kind of the middle of this, this section and we see that Paul's beginning to respond. He says, so to keep me uh, from becoming conceited. And, and so what we see actually in verse 12 is that Paul is beginning to lay out this amazing vision that he's talking about. And, and in the, the book of 2 Corinthians, he's been, he's been working to combat some opponents of his ministry, some people who were, were calling themselves apostles or, or, or leaders in the church, and, and they were beginning to challenge some of, Jesus, or some of Paul's teachings. And so Paul's been going back and forth, kind of addressing each issue as they come in this letter. And and in chapter 12, he, he begins to address the fact that they, they claim to have some spiritual s- supremacy. And he says, you know, I, I must go on boasting. He says in verse 1, though there's nothing to be gained by it, I'll, I'll go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ. And so he begins to tell this message about a, a man that he knows. And, and you'll begin to see that he's actually talking about himself. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows. And I know that this man was caught up in paradise, whether in body or out of the body, I, I don't know, God knows. And he heard things cannot, that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but not on my own behalf. Not, I, I will not boast except for in my weaknesses, though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. And so in the first six verses, we see that, that he begins to say, hey guys, you want to talk about spiritual experiences? You want to talk about spiritual authority and, and supremacy? I, I know a guy who, who was caught up in the third heaven, and, and, and he saw and heard things that, that no person should speak of. And so, in fact, Paul doesn't speak of the specifics of this. And, and I'm not trying to speculate on what he saw. We're not trying to figure out what the nature of the third heaven is. But the point that Paul is trying to make is that, that he has recognized uh, and has seen pretty amazing things in his life. He has seen spectacular things in his life. And yet, the point of his focus is not in his uh, spiritual supremacy, but in his weakness, as we're going to see. He's going to show us that that we're most likely to experience God's strength and His power, not in, in these moments of, of, of rapture, but in moments where we are faced with the reality of our own weakness, our own frailty, and our own need. Because it's in those moments that we are most receptive to receive Jesus as Lord and receive God as, as God. So let's look at verses 7 and 8. So he says in verse 7, following all that he had just said, So, to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation, this image in, in heaven that he had, saw, had seen, uh, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. And, and so we see that, that because of this amazing experience, God gives him some sort of thorn. Uh, the word there, it can mean thorn, it can mean steak. Uh, not steak like the food, but steak like the, the wooden object. And, and he, he's given this, this messenger of Satan, it says, uh, something that's, that, that harasses him, that bothers him. And, and, and this has been uh, really a point that, that a lot of ink has been spilled over. Uh, theologians and, and commentators alike have tried to figure out what exactly is the nature of this thorn. And the reality is we don't know. What we do know, we can see from Scripture that this was uh, some sort of messen- messenger of Satan, right? This was a, an instrument of Satan still under the, the sovereignty of God because God sent this, and it was given to him in the flesh, but we don't know if he means his physical body or his sinful flesh. Maybe it's a temptation. Maybe, it, maybe it's a physical ailment. 
to keep me from being conceited. So there's basically two views here that one, it's, it's either this physical thing or temptation thing, or two, it's, it's a relational thing. So it could be a physical ailment, a sickness, something that, that God had allowed into his life in order to keep him humble, or perhaps it was, it was some sort of temptation that w- was besetting and, and kept him from, from becoming too conceited, or alternatively, it was, it was a relational struggle. And th- there's, there's arguments either way. I mean, the relational struggle is clear if you read many of the the letters that Paul speaks of, there, he's got a lot of opponents, a lot of people who betray him, a lot of people who speak out against him, a lot of people who try to, try to really stop him and his ministry. And so we're not sure what the nature of it is, but we realize that this is intended and it's purposeful on God's part to, to keep him humble. This affliction was sent by God to keep him from becoming too proud. Now, One of the benefits of the reality that we don't know what this is is that really I think it opens this up to our own lives. While you and I may not have a a direct messenger from Satan, I I hope that's not the case in your life, uh, there, there are challenges, there are weaknesses, there are situations either relational or physical that, that really do challenge us and, and present to us our own inability to, to orient or change or, or manage our lives out of weakness, whether it's a relationship that, that's broken and, and that really challenges our ability to, to uh, manage our own emotions and our behavior, or, or it's a physical thing where we've been sick and it's a chronic sickness and, and it's something that we've prayed for and asked God to, to remove. Either way, there are these things in your life and my life that God has sovereignly allowed to enter into our lives, and these things challenge our idea of our own strength. I mean, if, if you can't think of anything, we can just step back and consider the coronavirus and, and, and all that that has it, it entailed. It, it's caused pressure both in our, our concern for our health. It's, it's caused pressure and concern for our relational well-being. You know, extroverts are going crazy and introverts are getting bored. Um, and it, it gives us concern in our financial well-being. You know, what am I going to do? Am I going to laid off? I got laid off. What am I going to do? How is this going to, how am I going to make it through? There, there are many, many situations, even as it relates to just this issue, that, that present to us our own weakness. You and I face weaknesses, and the question still remains, how, how do we relate to it? How do you and I relate to it? And I'm, I'm encouraged, and I want you to be encouraged that, that God has something good for us in this. Although at this point, it's, it, it seems like the, the answer is not exactly what, it, what we would like. Look at the next verse with me, verse 9. He said he had prayed three times in verse 8, and he says, verse 9, but he said to me, talking about God, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I'll repeat that. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. God's grace is sufficient for us. Now, when I think of prayer and when I think of God being a good God, I think of saying, God, please heal this problem in my life. Please fix this problem. Please heal this this issue in my body. And God saying, I'm a good God. I'm a holy God. I'm a righteous God. I'm going to fix that problem. And boom, my headache goes away. Or boom, my my body ache goes away. Or boom, my financial problem goes away. I get a check in the mail. Or I I get a a call from from um, an employer. That's how I would like to see these things happen. I would like to see God give me what I want and, and not have me have to face my own weakness. But what does he say? He says, no, no, no. Not my, my provision, my stuff, my, my things are, are sufficient. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. And, and, and here we see that, that, that Paul is tapping into something that we already saw in Jesus Christ. You know, it's not... It's not a mistake that we see in verse 8 that, that Paul says, I prayed three times. You know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, Jesus was, was praying and he was considering the fact that he was about to be betrayed and crucified and, and really bear the wrath of a righteous God. And, and he prays three times that, that the Bible says this cup would pass. Three times. God, if, if there's any way for this not to happen, if there's any way for me not to experience this situation let it be so. God, if there's any way, three times, one, two, three, and each time we hear effectively that God says, no, this is the way we're going to do it. 
And Paul is repeating that. He says, you know, three times I pleaded in the Lord. And there's this idea of, you know, once you've said it three times, once you've prayed it for three, for three times, there's, a, there's com- a completion about it. Now, don't take that and run with it and say, if I pray three times, and you know, that, that's not what we're trying to do. We're not going to build a weird theology over on this. But Paul is tapping into some sort of parallel experience that Christ experienced. That three times he prayed and three times Jesus said no. And, and we see that, that God has a different plan for Paul's weakness. Now, family, if your Christianity allows you to sidestep things that Jesus and Paul could not sidestep, you're probably doing Christianity wrong. I'll say it again. If, if your Christianity allows you to sidestep suffering, pain, hardship, difficulty, if, if the way you believe suggests that I shouldn't experience these things, I'm not going to allow myself to experience these things, then, then you're, you've misunderstood what God has promised in the gospel. Because Jesus promises that he'll be with us, but he doesn't promise that we won't experience suffering. And in fact, he promises that we will experience suffering. In this world, you will face hardships. And, and we see James talk about it. We see Peter talk about it. You know, P- James says in, in, in his letter, he says, Consider pure joy. C- count it all joy when you face trials, when you face trials. He doesn't say, guys, Christianity allows us to pray so that we don't experience trials. If you're experiencing trials, you don't have strong enough faith. No, he says that God will take us through faith into trials. And so we see here that Paul is being led by God into trials. He had prayed, God, remove this weakness, remove this thorn in my flesh. And when we say weakness here, what we're not talking about is feebleness or a lack of physical strength. He's talking specifically about the situation that God has orchestrated by this thorn in the flesh. So for you and I, weakness is not necessarily just like, hey, I'm not good at math, but it's this idea that there are situations in our life that that test our ability to trust God. There are situations in our life, whether it's relational or physical or emotional or spiritual, that test our ability to to trust God. And it's those weaknesses that God is allowing into our lives to open up a door so that we might experience his power. In Paul's weakness, he was able to experience God's suffering, or God's sufficiency. In Paul's suffering, he was able to experience God's sufficiency. He experienced the sufficiency of God to provide power. Whereas Paul would have liked, I imagine, to to be able to have some sort of power to overcome this spiritual thorn, this physical thorn, this relational thorn, whether he, whatever it was, there's a likelihood that he wanted to be able to press through, but but God said, no, I'm going to provide the power. He was able to experience this this strength to comfort him, this this sufficiency to comfort him, whereas he might have been saying, God, where are you? Why won't you fix this problem? We, we hear the, the, the resounding response of God, my grace is sufficient, and in those words, I, I have comfort for you, right? If, if God's grace is sufficient for his weakness, that means that God's grace proceeds and prepares and is ready for his weakness. It means that God has prepared his grace for this moment. His, God's sufficiency uh, is able to minister through Paul despite his weaknesses, you know, we, we've been going to Mobile Hope. We've been doing a lot of things in the neighborhoods. We've been doing small groups. And, and the temptation, and I preach on Sundays, and we have worship on Sundays. And the temptation is to think, okay, I have to do this really well or everything's going to fail. And certainly we want to have a level of excellence, and, and we want to do things well. But, but at the end of the day, we trust not in our ability to do things well, not in our cameras, not in our internet service, not in, in our computers and our guitars and our, our Nord Electros, uh, but we trust in God who's able to minister through us despite our weaknesses. Family, sometimes your and my desire for self-sufficiency gets in the way of us experiencing God's sufficient grace. I'll say it again. Sometimes your and my desire for self-sufficiency gets in the way of our ability to experience God's grace. And, and sometimes when we pray, we're pushing against God and we're saying, God, uh, help me do this better. Help me be better. Help me to, to, to push harder. And certainly we want to be pursuing God with excellence and certainly we want to be loving God and, and, and doing all the things that he's told us and commanded us to do. But there's a moment where we, we recognize that I am ultimately not trusting my ability to follow God, but I'm still in my activities trusting God. 
even as a saved, trusting, faithful individual, I am still trusting God's sufficiency for my life day to day. God is calling you and me not just to believe God in this moment at, at the beginning uh, where, where we, we put our trust in Jesus and we, we respond to the gospel and as though after that it's all our hard work. No, we start by trusting in faith and we continue trusting in faith. And the moment that you and I go off this path of trusting in faith and trying to be self-sufficient, that's the moment where we, we begin to push against God in his desire to give us power, to give us strength, to give us the ability to move forward by his strength. He says, my grace is sufficient to you. Family, in your weakness right now, in the weaknesses that that likely have popped into your mind, the situations that, that are at the forefront of your mind, God's grace is sufficient. God has grace for you right now to sustain you. God has grace right now to, to strengthen you. God has grace right now to carry you through. Maybe it's, maybe it's a financial situation and you're, you're saying, how am I going to do this? And God's waiting for you to say, God, will you do this? You know, he promises in Matthew 6, uh, don't worry about whether you eat or drink or what you wear. I, I handle the grass, the, the flowers, the birds, and they, they, look at, they look great and they're cared for. And you're worth more than all of those things. So instead of worrying about these things, instead of trying to do these things in your own self-sufficiency, trust in me. Pursue my kingdom. God has grace for you. Maybe you're in a physical, uh, you have a physical ailment, you've got some illness or, or chronic pain, and, and you've, been, you've been going to God and saying, God, uh, help me. And, and you've, you've thought to yourself, you know, if I could just get a little bit more faith, then God would move. And maybe, maybe in this moment, God is, has said no because he's, he's working something in and through you. And he's trying to produce something, and he's bringing you to a place where you will hear and receive him differently. Now, that is not to say that we don't pursue God in prayer and say, God, please heal. Please bring healing to my brokenness. But in those moments, we, we want to be receptive to his sufficiency and his grace. Should he say no? Should he say, not right now? Should he say, this is not the season? When we understand that God is at work in our weaknesses, we can embrace him, and we can embrace uh, our weaknesses in order to experience his strength. Look at verses, uh, the second part of verse 9 and then verse 10 with me. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, with insults, hardship, persecution, calamity. And hear this, he says, for when I am weak, then I am am strong. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul embraces his weaknesses, his inability to avoid this this thorn in the flesh. He he embraces it. God had said no three times, so he embraces it. I recognize this is a weakness that you have placed in my life for a particular purpose, to experience your power in sustaining me. Family, what weaknesses in your life do you need to embrace in, in order to experience God's power through it? You know, in Romans, I, I, I quoted this before, but it, it's worth going there now. In Romans chapter 8, one of the most amazing chapters of the Bible, you should go read it after this. Uh, verse 28, Paul says this. And we know that for those who love God and are called, uh, I'm sorry, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. It's this amazing promise that we know that, that for those who are called according to God's purposes, those who love God, God works all things for our good. And I like to think of this verse as the 30,000 uh, foot uh, eagle eye view of our lives. And, and I often quote it to myself, God, you're working all things for my good. And, and it, it looks good on a mug. You could put it on a t-shirt. You'd sound strong. It'd be great. But then we come to a place like this, and we come to points in our life but where we say, but God, uh, what about this hardship? What about this affliction? What about this suffering? What about this relational strife? God, and, and, and all of a sudden, this idea of, of God working all things for the good, it, it doesn't sound, it doesn't feel good at street level. You know, I was talking to my wife yesterday about uh, this, this thought that I had that, that Google Earth is really neat because it allows you to see 
really anything. And you can, you can search your own house. You can search another person's house. You can go see what's going on in India. You can find out what's going on in, in, in Antarctica. And, and there's this kind of, just to varying degrees, you can see with different levels of granularity. And so I, I remember looking and thinking, you know what, let's see what my house looks like. And, and at 30,000 feet, I'm like, that's my house. You know, I can see it. There's, I'm on a I'm on a townhouse row, and, and there I am. There's my road, and, and there's the main road. This is really cool. Here's Leesburg. This is neat. Let's, let's dig d- down a little bit deeper, and I go closer, and I'm saying, oh, I can see, the, I can see my roof and, and all these things. And, and then there's street-level view, and I see my house, and I, I think to myself, oh, I, should, I wish they'd let me, know, n- let me know before they came and took pictures because my bush was a little raggedy, and, and you know, maybe there were some leaves in the front. There's some stuff that I needed to handle in my house before it looked good. And, and sometimes we look at our life, and at 30,000 feet, we say, God, you work all things for my good. I know that. You're working all the things for my good. But when we get down to street level, we don't love what we see. We say, God, there's some things that are messed up here that I really want you to fix. But it's in this moment that God is working all things for our good. Family, God works all things through our good through the process of taking us through our weakness to show us his strength. It's in that process that God works all things for our good. I mean, I, I'm thinking about th- this, this whole COVID-19 p- pandemic. I mean, as a pastor, I can't meet with you in person. I can't, we can't congregate. We can't minister directly face-to-face. We can't, uh, there, there are so many things that we can't, we can't baptize. Virtual baptism isn't, isn't a thing. This idea of, of me, you know, Go to your, go to your uh, tub, fill it with water, and I bet, you know, that's not a thing. That's not how God gave it to us. And so God has allowed us to be experiencing, at least in the church, some serious weaknesses. And yet, and yet, one, these are things that I would never would have chosen. I never would have said, you know what would be a great idea is if we completely dismantled everything that we were supposed to do as, as a church. That, that makes things successful. No, I never would have chosen that. And yet, we're finding that in this moment, it's done some things for us. It's, it's narrowed our focus, whereas there were many things that you could be focused on. All of a sudden, we realize, you know, Sunday mornings, we want people to hear the word and worship God. You know, we want people throughout the week to experience real community in small groups, and we want to be a blessing and light and salt to our community, to our surrounding area. All of a sudden, we're able to see with clarity the purpose of the church, where before, you might have gotten distracted in one or two different other directions. You know, he's given us focus. He's given us blessings. It's amazing to see how you've been giving uh, uh, financially and, and uh, in terms of materials so that we can re- reach our community. People have been so generous. And in the same way that, that in Philippians, Paul talks about how they were giving out of the, the overflow of their, their, um, their abundance of, of joy. Or, I'm sorry, it talks about the, the it talks about the Philippians in, in one of the books of Corinthians, and he talks about how the, in their, their joy, their, their poverty, and their desire to bless, all of those things come together to, to see great resources being raised for the church. And, and we've seen that. We've seen you give sacrificially. And God has shown us his strength. He's shown us how he can still move through people. He can still bring about transformation. He can still bring people to faith in Jesus Christ, and we can trust in him. You see, family, God allows you and me to experience weakness in order that we might receive his strength. And let me tell you, as as strong as you are, God's strength is better than your strength. As strong as you and I are, God's strength is better than your strength. And God, because he loves us, and because he so wants us to experience his grace, because he wants to experience the grace that's unique to moments of suffering, he will allow us to go through periods of hardship to experience weakness in order that we might experience and be receptive to his strength. What weaknesses are you facing today, family? What, what situations have you prayed through and asked, God, would you remove this from my life? What situations have you pled to God and said, God, remove this from my life. Remove this relational strife. Remove this physical ailment. Remove this situation. Remove this pressure. Perhaps, like Paul, God is calling you to relinquish control over your life. Perhaps uh, what is most important 
is, is rather than you being delivered from any particular situation, is, is, is you experience the, experiencing the grace of God through that situation. You see, you and I, family, we can trust God in the middle of affliction because we have a Romans 28, 28 God, a God who is working all things for our good. And in the moments of weakness, we can remember that, that bird's eye view of God's sovereignty and his goodness. So family, today, let God's grace be the source of your strength in whatever hardship you face. Let's pray. Father God, I confess that e- even for me, this is, this is a tough thing to pursue your strength rather than trying to muster my own strength, to relinquish control over my life rather than trying to, to, to hold it tightly. But Lord, I thank you that you are good. You are good. It's worth saying a third time, you are good. And you are working all things for my good. The things that I can recognize, oh yes, that's for my good. And the things that I would say, that is not, that's not a, a direction I want to go. And in both cases, you are working all things for my good. And I thank you, God, that you're working all things for the good of those who are listening to this and are, are called according to your purposes, those who have put their trust in you. And I thank you, Lord, for that. If you are, are listening to this and, and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've never trusted in this God who works all things for the good who of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. You've never considered, am I called according to his purpose? Am I, is Jesus calling me? My, my encouragement to you would be to say, yes, he's calling you. Respond in faith. Believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. Believe that he's Savior. Look at your life and realize that, that you can't control it and relinquish control and hand it to God. The Bible says that if we're if we confess our sins, our disobedience toward God, and we, we repent, we turn to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us. If that's you, if you want to turn away from self-sufficiency, if you want to turn away from, from trying to make things work in your life, and you want to turn to trusting in the God who deals not only with your brokenness, not only with your hardship, not only with your affliction, but with the sin that condemns you and me, then I want you to pray this. God, I, I, I confess my sin to you. Everything I know to be disobedience, I confess it and I turn away from it and I trust, turn to you and I trust Jesus to make me right before God. I trust his righteousness, his life of righteousness, his death on the cross, his, his uh, resurrection all on my behalf so that I might have relationship with you, God, and, and I might experience the grace of your strength in my weakness. If that's you, please respond in the, in the chat. Let us know. We'd love to... We'd love to continue to walk out this walk with you, that this was never meant to be a journey that you walked out alone. This is intended to be something that that you experience with us and that we together experience the grace of God in our own corporate weakness and we see the power and strength of God manifest in our life. Well, family, I am so thankful for you. I'm thankful for all that you're doing. And, and And I wanna take a moment to invite you to respond by, by giving. You know, we've been taking up a, a benevolence offering over the last few weeks, and we're going to continue to do so because we want to be salt and light in our community. As I said before, our, our purpose has really been focused. We, we care about seeing that we all dine on the Word of God and we worship God on Sundays that we all experience small groups. And in those small groups, what we experience is relationships that allow us to spur one another on to to faith and good works. And we want to be a blessing to our community. And so we would love for you to take part in this opportunity to give. If you want to give, you can do so online. Uh, You can press the give button. You go to gracecup.org slash sterling and press the give button. Or if you're uh, in online.church, there's a give button there as well. Otherwise, if you want to give in the form of of a check, you can make it payable to Grace Covenant Church and write Sterling Benevolence in the memo, and you can send it to our offices. But let me pray. Father God, I pray that you would take these offerings that we give, that you would multiply them, that you would use them, Lord. And we recognize that even in our giving, the greatest that we could give is still weakness in in your sight. 
And so, Lord God, we, we pray that in, in, our, in our, our giving, we would see your strength, that you would use these things for the glory of your son and the benefit of our community. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your generosity. And so now it's time for us to, to dismiss. But before we do that, I want to speak a, a blessing over your life. And I want to say this, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. God, you are good. We worship you. Amen. Love you, family.